Well, it's Shark Week. You, I thought it was actually kind of cool that we get to see you yeah. during Shark Week. Well, I, Do I you a, are you about to be busy for this, or is this? N- no, I, I actually, um, I when I'm painting, which is most all day long, I will either listen to sports if there's good sports going on, like um, I'm a cricket fan and, uh-huh. <laughs> and love all that. Um, England are playing Australia right now. Okay. Um, or oh, the West Indies are playing somebody. Um, uh, the Indian Premier League is fascinating to watch. <laughs> it is very competitive. But I also watch when you get like Nat Geo Shark Fest yeah. on, which is a month long. It's a much better production in my mind. Less, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, less sensational mm-hmm. than uh, Discovery Shark Week. Mm-hmm. And much more informative. And many of the, a lot, a lot of the um, episodes are science-based and a lot of our contemporaries in the shark world are hosts, hosts of those shows. Okay. And they are very instructive educational shows. Mm-hmm. And I, they have their own fair share of, of shark attack stories, but they're, they're reenactments and just about everybody survives. But it's, it's like, how much of that do you need? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. When there's so much more to learn about the animals. Mm-hmm. You know? well, mm-hmm. How so. much does that... Uh, affect what you do in terms of conservation or research in like the the sensationalizing of of things we when we're underwater matt we 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 we're never going to create a situation that is going to cause any danger to to the animal or to us so we're not looking for that we're not looking for a, mm-hmm. a sketchy interaction yeah mm-hmm. um and in that book there's a there's a couple of chapters with jim abernethy with whom yep. we dived a great deal in the bahamas and there are there are strict protocols you have to follow. Otherwise, he's not going to allow mm-hmm. you to dive in his boat. Ah. So if you play the ass or you're dangerous or whatever, and some of the places we go to are very remote. So if anything happens to you, you, you are dead. And you know you you're either going to bleed out or you're going to get the bends. Or it's it's if it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, there's no sympathy from people like that, right. and I totally get it. Mm-hmm. So you. Over many years, they've learned the protocols with diving with these big animals, and you, you jolly well observe them. Otherwise, you're not going to play. Uh, I see. It's because so int- you're going to endanger yourself yeah. and other people. You know. Yep. So I'm curious about why, when I read that <clears> chapter, <throat> it was everybody wears all black. All black. You don't show your skin, including head, gloves. Gloves you, are very important. You always stay in a group, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So w- how did he develop that? protocol uh just because every situation is different and certain times a year especially with tiger sharks um they're a big animal they are not picky they'll eat anything and so they will test you and oh. so um it's nice to have a big camera there so when they come up i used to have a gates housing with a sony fx whatever whatever mm. in it the whole thing weighed 50 pounds and you had a monitor on it with a screen and you would you would let the shark come and mouth it and bite it and then go away. And Jim would say, "Don't hit the shark. Don't yeah. You know? Don't push mm-hmm. back. Don't push back. Just on let, it. Just it. let it. He, he doesn't have hands. He just he's just checking you out. Oh yeah. But don't you ever let them get behind you. So when there's more than one, um, you know, your buddy and you would work together to to have okay. three hundred and sixty covered because you don't want to get that, surprised. Oh, that's why uh, you're back. That's why you're back to back sometimes Best. When you're... it depends on the situation okay. and as situations evolve and more sharks come in because you might be underwater for three four five hours at a time because you're in very shallow water mm-hmm. um they they come because they follow the scent trail which is laid purposely to get them to come in and many of these sharks are, are conditioned now to the experience and he has his 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 girls he calls them players i got a player and you know then they graduate to becoming a a model and then a superstar, depending on how interactive they are. I heard one. I yeah. read one was a Emma, superstar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Emma. She's big girl. She's like twelve hundred pounds. Wow. Um, so anyway, she just got used to you guys coming. I I think so, and and to him in particular. Okay. And, but she would go like they all do. They migrate and go somewhere else to do whatever they have to do, and they come back. And that's why we studied them for years, um, ten years on tiger sharks. Mm-hmm. We tagged maybe. 80 with yeah. electronic uh, satellite tags. Fascinating animals. They spend six months of the year out in the open ocean mm-hmm. in the northwestern Atlantic. They can go out far beyond Bermuda from the Bahamas to 
the the Mid Atlantic Ridge up to New York, come back down, and do it time and time again. And uh, in the winter, they go and spend it in the in the shallow reef areas of the Bahamas, um, Turks and Caicos, USVI, all that area, and they have an entirely different lifestyle mm-hmm. where they're living in twenty feet of water, ten feet of water, eight feet of water, feeding on different things, mm-hmm. turtles, stingrays, stuff like that, dead birds, compared to the the open ocean existence, which is really a desert out there when you think about it. It's a blue desert. So yeah. why bother is the question. Right. Why do you do that? And the the thought is that they're just conditioned to the migrations of the loggerhead turtles, transatlantic Oh, migrations. they're following. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're, they specialize in turtles. Okay. And, you know, they get lucky with a dead porpoise, a dead whale, or a dead seabird. Or mm-hmm. They're scavengers. Mm-hmm. They're not a very quick, fast-moving animal um, like some of the other oceanic species, which will zip around you. I mean, fabulous to watch. Mm-hmm. But we learned a lot about tigers and have huge respect for them. Mm-hmm. And they're a very, very tough animal, resilient. I don't think we ever kill one. The, the, you couldn't kill them. <laughs> yeah. They're tough. So yeah. I'm curious about yeah. the rays. Yeah. Um, you describe a little bit well, about stingrays, the, yeah. The, yeah, the stingrays, the yeah. stingrays and the impact of tourism on yeah. um, the, their patterns of, of eating or hunting. Right, and so, what are your thoughts on that? Is that it's, good? It's is funny it? you should mention it, Denise, because I I just wrote an article this morning for a magazine, one mm-hmm. of our local magazines, because we haven't really since the since the pandemic ended, uh, we were lucky enough to maintain our biannual surveys, which we've been doing since two thousand and two. Um, so it's the longest running study of a marine interactive uh, project or program in the world. And of course, it's very famous. Um, millions of people go there. And uh, certainly before the pandemic, we had probably 1.5 million people a year go to that spot. Wow. <clears throat> in so the Bahamas, right? In Grand Cayman. Or in Grand Cayman, yes. So it represents um, a huge economic um, engine mm-hmm. for the island. So when we moved there, we said um, nobody knew the first thing about them. So mm-hmm. we got a study going in 2002, again with Nova. Mm-hmm. Had a postgrad student do all the the heavy lifting. He and his girlfriend. Uh, he did his master's thesis. But it, we built a database of of the animals that were there. We tagged them all with a with a pit tag, which is like you give your pet. Mm-hmm. You can scan it, and sh- there's a number. Um, so we followed many of them um, for over twenty years now, and they were probably wow. twenty years old when we first tagged them. Wow! So they they live for a long time. 40 years? How long do they live? Oh, probably 60 or 70 years. Holy wow. moly, I had no idea. Yeah. I, yeah, I had no idea. Well, most sharks and rays will live for a very long time. Those whale sharks you saw up there, they'll live for 120 years. What? Yeah. I didn't know yeah. that. The Greenland shark will live for 400 years. 400? No. no idea. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh yeah, they're cool. The hammerhead, the big hammerhead in the picture there, they, they'll live for 30 years. Wow, I had no idea. No, yeah. I think I, yeah. I think I was I always was under the impression it was the turtles that lived for. <laughs> they, well, they do. They too. do too. They right? live for a hundred years. So, uh, which brings me to another point. So, a you're looking at um, how, how is this system created with the with all these animals coming into a place? It's not fenced. They're not constrained in any way. They're free to come and go. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike many other interactions in the Bahamas and some of the other Caribbean islands where they catch them and put them into a contained area, um, the, the Cayman situation is somewhat unique. And there were, we tagged over 650 animals there now in 20 years. So that shows how dynamic it mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. All the more reason to study it better, but all the more reason to make it sustainable. So after Hurricane Ivan hit us in 2004, which is a devastating storm, we had no tourists for three months. And so the site fidelity that was exhibited by these animals um, disintegrated, basically. Nobody was feeding them, so they left. Mm -hmm. And they can survive on their own quite happily, uh, one of the things we studied. But so supplementing feeding uh, took place. We got them back, and the, the, the numbers never came back to what we had before, but we had about... 130, 140 animals on a daily basis interacting. And then the government um, limited the amount of food you could give them for a ridiculous reason. It wasn't affecting them negatively whatsoever. 
and the numbers went down to about, on the average survey, 120 before the pandemic. And then the pandemic came and it was like, wow, crash. But before that, the population had gone down in 2011, 2012. And you only pick this up if you're doing regular surveys. This points to the benefit of doing it. And where this this interaction is generating so much income for the for the country, we reckon each animal generated about five hundred thousand dollars a year per animal. Wow. Really. And so if you're going back to the longevity, if you live for twenty years, that's ten million dollars you've done. And we know they live for much longer. Wow. And at this time they weren't protected. Which leads me back to in 2011, 2012, the population crashed while well, they were being stolen. Oh. Yeah. And so uh, because they were not protected, there was no law yep. Yep. to protect them. So I said to the minister, <laughs> dude, <laughs> you have to do something. You know, why haven't you protected these animals? There's, this is what they generate for the country uh, on an annual basis. And the response is, oh, I never thought about it that way. Mm. You know, so it's like the value of the living animal um, and it can be a grouper in a reef, it can be a piece of coral, it can be a sea fan, it can be a conch, it can be a blue marlin. The value of the living animal for the the, the availability of interaction um, with humans is far greater nowadays than that animal consumed, whatever you're doing yep. with it. You know? Yep. So that's... <sighs> It would and it was that so he's that was the first time he had ever considered that. Is this something that uh, do you see this as being a thing? Or we need to spread spread the word. Well, the, the 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 whole legislative process. We in twenty fifteen we got the the national conservation law put in place. It took forever, just foot dragging by successive governments. You know the story. It happens every, in every country, mm -hmm. but it finally got done and it protected a huge amount of a great amount of reef area. Sharks were included, by the way, so sharks are fully protected, finally. And, and we've seen the result of that. Um, but stingrays were, um, the process was accelerated. So in 2013, they had official protection. No possessions. You couldn't have them anywhere. Um, and you, handling, there were handling procedures put in place. And Jessica, my daughter, did um, a whole handling video for the Department of Environment. She actually worked there at the time. Mm -hmm. So things changed. Um, the 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 national conservation law also helped promote uh, increase in marine protected areas, which is something we can talk about another time. But it's becoming so important in terms of doing something about overfishing, mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. It's our main tool, and um, the 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 faster the science is conducted to convince the various mm -hmm. governments, this is the right thing to do. This is how much and where you want to protect. And get it done. Otherwise, we're going to go further down the slope yep. of of um, just overfishing, unreported fishing, illegal fishing. And where does the most over or is it all, um, like yeah? Where, where where in the world? <laughs> it happens everywhere now. Yeah. Um, uh, Cayman is such a small place. Yeah, it's tiny. It's like a little finger in the ocean sticking up out of the bottom of a very deep part of the sea. Uh, when you look at you know some of the other Caribbean islands and um, Central America and places we love to fish, yeah, um, that have vast marine resources that are even now being you know heavily overfished. I don't know where you want me to start. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> we've 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 hooked up with the Bonaire Corporation, who by the way have produced these books for me. Well, the last th three, uh, yeah, they did this one, this mm -hmm. one, and this one. And Panama Paradise. They've done four of my six books. Okay. Um, they want me to now sort of co-host um, a, a magazine, TV, podcast show thing called The State of the Ocean, SOTO. We call okay. It. And so we're, we're trying to figure out, it's such a big subject, matter, or topic. Where do you begin? Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about, well, you take each little section where things are going wrong, kind of highlight yeah. it for a little bit and then point out um, how you can fix it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's what I was going to say yeah. is just even the, uh, the, the idea that of, of, of saying to somebody that this animal is worth more alive than dead mm. to you. And Giant step forward. And people, people think about things completely differently. Yes. Um, yeah. 
They, it's so, the, it highlights the importance of why you need to be able to collect data on mm, patterns right. of marine life or impact of changes they would never think about. You know, they don't think that when they ride a boat and they pay their money and they get to swim with a stingray and take a, po a picture, how much that impacts the local economy. All of that. And so this is why at the same time we're doing the Facebook Lives, going back to the, the shutdown, um, and we use some of our content from all our different expeditions to to highlight what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the the need for more education, especially here in Florida, marine science education was immediately apparent because of all the stuff we're getting. Why don't you know about this? Well, mm -hmm. we we never get taught this, mm -hmm. and it, that story is repeated over and over again. And so, the other focus now, headed by Jessica and Steve Roden, the, the chairman of the foundation is on a marine science education initiative in all the counties here in Florida. And we've been picking away at it now for pretty hard for two and a half, nearly three years. Mm -hmm. But it has to happen at the same place, same pace as you're doing the research work mm -hmm. and getting the results out in a timely fashion. And this is one of the hang-ups of, of fisheries science. It sometimes takes five years for the, mm -hmm. the, the results of a study especially if you're studying long-lived animals like sharks yeah. or turtles, yep. which are extremely long-lived, to get out to make, so you can make the correction yeah. uh, in a reasonable time to make a difference. And so everybody's like now publishing much faster, getting yeah. stuff out there, taking action. And I had this conversation with Barbara Block from Stanford just last week about, because she's one of the, the real world's authorities on pelagic, the pelagic realm. <clears throat> Make a shark up there. Look at the tiger. <laughs> oh, that was from. Is that yeah. that's all footage of yours, right? Yeah, oh my yeah. gosh. That's a whale shark there. Yeah, from Mexico. Oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Doing what we call la botella when they're like a bottle and they feed <clears throat> on plankton right at the surface. The, the plankton is so dense they don't have to swim. They just oh, go, they just open their mouths. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's wow. It's crazy. Fun to watch. <clears throat> but the point being that. Um, the, the the science is is the very first step mm -hmm. in this whole process. Mm -hmm. You use that data um, to educate people, and then once you're educated, you can actually move on to conservation because they understand the concept of conservation. Yeah, it takes uh, a lot of time to analyze, collect data, analyze data, and then make con draw conclusions from the data after to be able to say, here's the action that needs to occur next and you can only recommend it yeah you can only push it in front of the administrator yeah and and expect something meaningful mm -hmm. to happen mm -hmm. you know you hope the data speaks loud enough yeah. that it causes action yeah. in people in, in your particular case this is something i was curious about w was what role does the art play in that because you're you know you've got that uh, you're adding an extra element to all of this for sure um, the the art has become an important tool in the educational process more than in the research Whereas it's nice to have a pretty picture of a sailfish or a striped marlin or mako shark on your website. Um, they look great. A photo would also do. But in the art, um, because I painted certain aspects of the life history of the animals, it, it tells a much better, more compelling story than just a photograph. Uh, and often with, with much better clarity than you can get with a photo. Um, because I... <laughs> We as artists, we have the ability to see what could happen, uh, especially things that happen quickly, especially in the open ocean, which the camera, you can't get the camera onto the action fast enough to capture yeah. the, yep. the interaction. But you've seen it enough times with you, your eyes exactly. and examined it enough yeah. times mm -hmm. that you can recreate yep. it. Now that makes, that, that makes perfect sense for... Go but, ahead. but to give you one specific example uh, about how actually um, you know fishery managers took action, the mako shark, which is is the, this guy right here, mm -hmm. um, it's a relation to the white shark, the smaller cousin, um, is a predator of all the other oceanic predators, uh, very fast, uh, but they don't grow to the same size mm -hmm. as as white shark, and that really have a completely different oceanic existence. They taste good because they eat tunas, they eat swordfish, they eat billfish. And so when people catch them, both commercial and recreational, they kill them. Um, Kent has done a lovely mako shark, by mm -hmm. the way. And um, if you get out to the 
NSU um, University Center, you'll see his big piece up there. Well, that's uh, that's also at NSU. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's it's only ten miles. Yeah, okay. we're gonna go. We'll, we'll definitely go see definitely it. worth seeing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and the one at IGFA, by the way, is is a stainless steel one. If you ah, you see yes. in the book how difficult stainless steel is, very hard to work with because you have to heat it to three thousand yes. degrees yes. compared to bronze. But it's he's got a twenty four foot high swordfish there, which is an amazing piece of work. Anyway, uh, back to where we were. Where were we? The you Mako know, shark. The Makos. Mm -hmm. So we tagged, I think, about 120 Makos now, both in the Yucatan and in the Mid-Atlantic. So two different areas, which ended up, through the number of tags we put out, being the sharks have completely different behaviors. Hmm. For the first thing you learned, the, the Gulf of Mexico and Western Caribbean ones stay in that area very much, except for a couple of individuals. The ones from the northeast, mid-Atlantic area, go on walkabout. They do these enormous trips almost all the way across the Atlantic, down to Brazil sometimes and back. Um, but staying a lot, a lot along the uh, continental shelf, which is where all the food is. Um, and the big thing was that 30% of our animals got killed. Oh. Okay. And how do we know that? Because the tag ends up on land. Oh. And, and the tags are talking to a satellite. And so um, the mortality rate- They're just thrown? Rate, hmm? They're just thrown? No, the, the fish is dead. Is oh, killed. the fish is dead in yeah. it. Okay. So they end up on a boat and then you get a straight line to the land. <laughs> and are you able to catch up with- but, Oh, yeah, because the, the reporting is down to five uh, meters. You can, go, you can go to the boat, you can go to the house, you can go and get the tag. Wow. You can pay a reward. And then whatever. ask why. Yeah. <laughs> why did you kill a fish that you could see was tagged, you know? Um, anyway, so, but that very high mortality rate sent off a whole bunch of alarms because it's 10 times higher than anybody calculated before. Oh, wow. And the key thing about doing this, not relying on fishing people mm -hmm. to give you the results, is it's called fishery independent. So you're not relying on that uh, data to come back from somebody else, mm -hmm. especially the fox who's guarding the hen house. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's really untainted data. Mm -hmm. Um, and the the NOAA, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and NOAA, and all the different fishery management councils said we've got to do something about makos. And within eight months, a year, they put in you know much higher minimum sizes um, that you could keep. Uh, they had said that if you're hauling uh, gear back and you've got a live mako shark on your line, you have to release it. Hard to enforce. Um, but there were other things put in place, and now there's a there's a two year moratorium on mako sharks oh, completely wow. in America. So uh, it went to um, a CITES um, ruling that you can't trans uh, you can't trade in mako sharks to, to um, overseas buyers, um, and also this two year moratorium. It's not enough, but it's it's a good first step mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the population is crashing. And how, so, so you said, thir was it 30% that dropped? 30% died, yeah. Wow. Were killed. Of the tag. Of, of the, the tag, tagged. yeah. Wow. But if that's representative yep. of the... Yeah, that's that's the maker there with the tag in it. That picture was taken in the Yucatan. Yeah. 200-pound oh, wow. maker. I, um, I want to ask about collaboration mm -hmm. yeah. because that has, has been a theme. But at some point, I hope, I also want to hear about... Um, how did you get comfortable diving with sharks? <laughs> How does one get comfortable looking through your goggles at a shark staring at you? Good question. And uh, <laughs> in in the last book, this is growing up in Jamaica. This uh -huh. one was ten thousand chicken sandwiches, and you haven't asked me why I called it that yet. But still. no, I, uh, no. I, guess. Uh -huh. um, I I reference. Uh, interactions with some sharks, especially the oceanic white tip, and I didn't have the the confidence um, to dive with them then, and I'm very glad I didn't, knowing what I know now, uh, the protocols because they make sense. And just to have jumped in in a swimsuit oh in the middle gosh. of the ocean with a with a oceanic white tip or two would have been not a cool move. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Things would have developed. And we didn't see that many tiger sharks. Um, we saw a lot of silky sharks and stuff like that. But we were kids. We were not diving into into water with them. Did you just and get, because you were living in a place where sharks were 
abundant, you just learn to swim with them or get used to having them around you? No, that 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 took some serious yeah. training, and and um, <laughs> especially when we started diving in the Bahamas mm -hmm. with with the tiger sharks. Mm -hmm. And the reason the Bahamas have sharks is because they banned longline fishing in 1993. Mm. There's a whole yep. section on it in yep. there. And and not so much fishing for sharks, but fishing for snappers with bottom longlines. And their bycatch was so, so much. This is a picture I want to show you. To jump in with a, with a pair of mating sperm whales back in 1975, was like a big deal, uh -huh. and I really thought I was going to die. <laughs> oh. um, so you have had that feeling a number of times. Uh, well, so. is, is this the right thing to do? Yeah, but the, it was. It seemed to be benign, and oh, wow. um, it, it developed some good art later on. But um, at the time, it was like, "Whoa, what's going to happen here?" And of course, as more people have dived with sperm whales, which is the first interaction I did, um, so. So much more knowledge has, has has come out about how they react to people in the water and how how just chilled they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, nineteen seventy five. We're out fishing for blue marlin off the western side, and we find these these whales spread out, and we got ahead of them as with an American Peace Corps guy um, snorkeling. We jumped in like a hundred yards ahead. I already figured that part out. Don't swim to them. A, you couldn't keep up, but let them swim, swim to you. And they came up and they came close, close, like as close to the door. But before they got into into re, uh, vision, you could you could lift your head up and see where they were and then swim, cut them off, lift up again and swim. And they came right at us. But the noise of their chattering, it was sweet talk. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. my God. <laughs> he was trying to impress her. Oh, oh, wow. And they were rubbing, you know, the heads were rubbing together, the bodies like this, a lot of touching going on, and they were covered in all these little fish around them, remoras and, and jacks and stuff. And the old guy had his wanger out. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, it oh, was, it, not, not only was it much bigger than mine, it was bigger <laughs> than me. <laughs> it was bigger than me. Yeah, you didn't want to get hit by anything no. much less that. Anyway, so, and, and, she had, you know, she was on heat. She had a blood coming out of her uh, genital opening. And um, I thought, you know, what do we do now? And they basically stopped where Casey is standing over there. And we were like, holy cow, you know. <laughs> but there was so much other life around them. It was it was mesmerizing. But the chatter was so loud. Oh, wow. And was that and then, mating chatter? That's all? I guess. It was, you know, X-rated talk. <laughs> <laughs> but... They basically, they just slowly lifted up their tails and, and dove down right in front of us. And the whole cavalcade of bodies just went straight down out of sight. Um, wow. As I say in the book, where all the blue lines join each other and they disappeared. And wow. it was like, we waited for a while for them to come up. But that was, I was very glad I did it, but I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And so it took a long time to go dive with some of these other big sharks. So... I think this was a theme that we discussed with Kent also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the idea of, I mean, you don't, sure, you can try to do it alone, but you're much, you're much more inclined to be successful when you do it as a part, as partnerships uh, through collaboration. So I'm curious about kind of how you approach that. Like, uh, are you talking about art or research? Either. I think, okay. yeah, I'm curious about all of it because it seems like you have a lot. You have You've a lot mentioned going. in well, in all of your books, you hmm. always acknowledge many many people at the beginning, and you've yep. mentioned lots of names today too. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, let's start with the art um, because it's a funny question I get. I I kind of object to it actually because it's like, um, do you do all your own work? Well, yes, <laughs> and it's like. Why are you asking the question? Isn't that kind of obvious? Or do you have so many different media? You work in five different media, blah, blah, blah. But I don't work in sculpture, do I? And so I'm not going to cast aspersions on anybody, but there are a number of artists who don't do all, the, all their own work. Uh, um, <clears throat> and, you know, they, they'll claim they do. <clears throat> but it's one reason I don't do sculptures at all. 
um, like many other artists who've gone into different different media. Um, I'm not sure that I'd be comfortable doing it, yeah. having a relationship with Kent like I do. Sure. And it's it's like he does such a great job. I love his style, execution. But he, he's also got, you know, half a century invested in the processes. And it's like, why would you want to do sculptures? Mm -hmm. you know? and, so, and I understand you know, what you mean. Yeah. Um, and so I don't collaborate with anybody except for Wyland occasionally uh, on these public murals. Um, I'm there for show, really. Mm -hmm. And it's message sending. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses them justifiably uh, for selling a lot of merchandise and stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, we do benefit with, with some you know, meager sales of, of books and stuff at the same time because he carries my art in his galleries to a certain extent. Um, but in terms of art, the, the collaboration is minimal. I mm -hmm. think Kent is the only person I've really had any in-depth discussions with um, about art. And I, I really can't collaborate. I'll give him advice and he me, but if that, that's the extent of it. Yeah. Complete difference with, yeah. difference with science because the the... There's so much to do. This is a big yeah. planet. Yeah, lots of stuff to to investigate, and so many unknowns. And you know, our limitation is money. And people say, especially here in Florida, well, why don't you do, you know, red tides killing all the fish and blue tides and you know, sewage and algae and all this stuff. And I said, we can't do everything. You know, we're limited by funding. Mm -hmm. We specialized in large pelagic fish because that's that's our niche. That's where we've been. And I just came up on the board there a while ago. Um, we've published 150, maybe 170 papers now, uh, mostly about sharks uh, and billfishes. Um, and that's that's where we're going to go. We're not going to go into coral. Um, we're collaborating on some coral replenishment, uh, but we're not going to go into other areas that that just going to eat up more time and money right and um, then you, and, and then it and makes you less dilute the effect right yeah. but then in the like you said in science there's so many roles and to me it almost is like a much bigger version of like you know we're doing a movie we have to collaborate because well, you, there's too many roles to play totally agree with you and of course in any scientific paper and i've, I've produced many in my time as a as a professional fishery scientist you have to refer to other people's work in your introduction, you're you're setting up your um, hypothesis, building on somebody else's. Exactly right, and looking for gaps to to further people's education. You can't obviously duplicate anybody else's work, so you have to collaborate in a sense. And you you talk with them, you call them, you meet them at conferences, you swap ideas. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm I'm talking with four different leading scientists, including the lady at Stanford, Barbara. Um, guys at Pier, also in California, um, and a guy from Virginia Institute of Marine Science about the, the best way to keep a tag on one of these large oceanic fish. You know, you can put it in the back with a spear, with a with a, like a little harpoon to keep it mm -hmm. in there. But these animals live exciting lives, and that stuff rips out. Oh. And it's like, you know, how do you keep a $5,000 piece of a computer basically on an animal for a full year without it pulling out. Well, all the heads are spinning around how best to do this. So, ah. you know, it's it's all about collaboration. Um, the tiger shark work that we did all this time in the Bahamas and um, Bermuda uh, and Cayman where we were, we were getting tremendous results from spot tags that we bolted onto their dorsal fins. You catch them, bolted on, and better results than anybody else in the field. And it was all about the height of the tag on the fin and keeping that tag, uh, when the fish comes to the surface, out of the water so you're getting a really good satellite hit on on your gadget. And, you know, it made all the difference. Six inches of water or height made all the difference. And we extended that in the, in the Galapagos to scalloped hammerheads, which don't often come to the surface. You can only really rely on fish that come to the surface all the time to use that tag. Um, the scalloped hammerheads, which are in such decline over there, they don't come to the surface that much. So we built a tether, a six-foot tether. So they could be six feet below the surface, but the tag would be at the surface. Mm. And so it's trailing it, which is a little dicey 
because you don't want anything hanging off like that yeah. flopping right. around. In the Caribbean, that wouldn't work at all, or the Western Atlantic, because there's so much seaweed. There's there's that get- sargassum seaweed everywhere that would foul it. It would load up and rip out of the shark in five minutes. So oh. these are all different things you got to kind of yeah. Make. And you, and yeah. If, if you don't get that right, you're wasting yeah. your time. And some of those whale sharks that we um, we see see coming back, they have their tags, even though they're bolted onto the fin, they're they're, they're bent over or the some of the bolts have been knocked. They've either either hit something solid or something hit them, or they've been dragging around a clump of the seaweed with them because it's stuck on the tag. You know, and it's just like wonder what happens out there as far as the art goes as far as mm-hmm. the paintings themselves what how important and how long do you dive to to study before you create something that's where the pandemic <laughs> came in such use because i couldn't travel so not only did i write that book but mm-hmm. i was also painting what i wanted to paint Oh, okay. And stuff that you know was got put on the shelf for a while. It's it's here, mm-hmm. but it's like when am I going to find the time? And so I did several big pieces. Um, I think this was pre-pandemic, but that that's a lot of time, a lot of detail, a lot of investment. Yeah. Well, and in in some people, like what I noticed in your book, mm. you must keep. Do you keep good? journals or oh, yes. how do you yeah well, how do you recall all of, yeah. how do you recall everything yeah i, I have a journal yeah <laughs> it just handwritten no yeah, every day every day yeah. well that's and, and that's something to I can and, show and, you one. <laughs> oh really uh, i i did you just bring my briefcase <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because i i um i write it every day typically when i'm not traveling and then when i'm traveling or coming back from an expedition mm-hmm a, I take a little notebook to record stuff that happens out at sea, because if you're doing, you know, five or six or ten day trips, mm-hmm. I, I'm recording everything that happens, everything, because it's invaluable when you want to go back to 2004 Venezuela on November the 23rd. What happened? You know, yeah. you got it all there, bang, and you got the pictures to back it up. So, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, um, the the <clears throat> I say paper never forgets, and it's it's a great way. A, it's entertaining to read through, but B, it's um, it's it's just very informative, and you know, especially where there's a disagreement about. <laughs> yeah, you can <laughs> go back. This, this is this wow, is yeah. wow. So it's a full page every day. That is great. Yeah. Do you write at the same time every day, or do you write in the morning normally? Um, have coffee. about the day prior. Yeah. Oh wow! Catch the news. Um, is it always about different things? Like, is it, or, or do you try to be? Do you try to capture certain details? Um, <clears throat> pretty much anything that goes on, and it can be man- mundane. Um, it can be, you know, like we have our weekly Zoom meetings on a Wednesday. The company Zoom meet. So if something unusual pops up in the discussion, that'll get down there. Mm-hmm. Um, fishing and diving, of course, is a fishing and diving log family log um yeah um i went out yesterday afternoon with the guy we tagged five there are five dolphins mahi mahi do you go back and do you go back and read them for oh, yeah. inspiration all the time like all the like, time yeah. like writing the this blurb today for the magazine about the stingray survey uh-huh i've forgotten if it was 2020 or 2021 that the pandemic uh-huh. hit us really hard so go back to i know it was march and there it was you know march the 24th uh-huh. We're, excuse me, we're out at the sandbar uh, doing a survey on the, on the rays and the bloody marine police came out and told us to hop it. And it was like, why? You know, <laughs> we're out here. There's nobody else out here. We haven't finished our day. We've got 90 minutes to go. Orders from the Minister of whatever, whatever. And it was like, you assholes. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to tell them that. <laughs> yeah. But you have record of but when it, it happened. Our, uh, it was our second day of the survey, and it was very important. And mm. of course, it became a bigger problem, which is what I'm talking about um, in the article about. Well, okay, you're going to lock everybody up. Nobody's going to feed the stingrays. So, how are you going to maintain this what we call site fidelity of the animals and the association with the place? Who is going to compensate for this thing? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. the government came up with a plan. In which we were not included because of the various strict regulations. It's like we're going to be on a boat. 
Yeah. Me and Jessica. Yeah. We're the same family. We live in the same house. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's interesting. If, that's, we, if we that's not distancing, I don't know what it yeah, is. We hadn't got our shots by then. And so well, they hadn't come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Mm-hmm. But the, yeah, that that's where it's really valuable. Yeah. And then, so, okay. So the government did that. Then they opened it up to tour operators to help. They, they, they sponsored them, basically. What was the effect of that? Did, did the rays come back? Because they were down to like 25 from 100 and and that had an immediate effect and we were able to record that and so at the next the next thing january 21 i got the result of all that survey right there at my fingertips Mm -hmm. the daily catch how many new animals how many males how many females it's all there yeah so bang bam finish the uh, document send it out Next. I oh. wonder if your journaling is a result of being a scientist. I'm sure it does. Yeah. Well, that's that's such an interesting thing <clears throat> to think about for an artist, too, because it, it's got to come in handy there. You know, it, it, I would think that when you're going back to remember a scene of some kind. Well, that's it, too. Um, <clears throat> but more importantly, when I actually painted something, because I don't date my paintings. Oh, so, I didn't know that. So Missy will say, well... Um, when did you do such and such and send me a, a thing? And I'll look back through the, the mm. diary and find it. Okay. So every single painting is listed. Is listed. Okay. How long it took why me to don't, do? Why don't you put the date? I just... Just don't? Just, just never doing it, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, good thing you have your journal. <laughs> yeah, if you get... Yeah. It's... it's um, I don't know. Maybe sometimes paintings hang around for a long time. They don't sell. You're kind of embarrassed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't uh. know. Well, I have one last yeah. question. Well, why? Oh, but, go ahead. But, but related, you brought up another question earlier about um, um, a, a record of the underwater experiences, and it it goes back to, and and Kent will tell everybody this, and I I tell people when I'm asked this too. There's no substitute for for getting in front of the animal yourself, mm-hmm. whether it's a body, a dead body, to look out for anatomy and close-ups. Or be the experience which you're trying to film, like this free swimming black marlin on the Great Barrier Reef with 50 sharks around you. It's like, did you get the shot? Did you not? But compiling that, that, that remembering that scene um, is more clear in your mind than mm-hmm. any picture can can probably yeah tell you. But also, uh, and this 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 is a real problem. You have such a fleeting experience with yeah. these animals. It is seconds, and that's why you often don't get the shot. And when you compare that, and having been to Africa now, and um, twice <laughs> in the last two years, and my my new um, my screensaver is not a marlin. Oh, I was going to wow. say that is not. This is like, you could have confused me. Tree. Look at that! I took that. That's incredible. Oh, you took it. How uh, yeah. far away was that? Um, I mean, you took it with your phone, didn't you? No, no, no. Oh, you, I was oh. going to say. <laughs> With a with a four hundred millimeter on the camera. Oh, four hundred okay. millimeter. I was going. Wow. Well, I'll show you the picture, the, other, the real picture without the blurb in front that of it. That is really <laughs> that's incredible. That's great. But you you know you you we did a we did thirteen days on the last expedition in April this year and the year before in Botswana we did eight days. But just the ability to sit there with a very good guide and a tracker and um, talk about the animals because they know everything. They grew up there. They have all the the local names, the habits, the whatever, whatever. Fascinating, just walking libraries of information, these people. And you've got all this time. Underwater, you don't have that time. Oh. Um, And you're limited by, even if you're diving with the sharks in 20 feet of water, your air eventually runs out Mm -hmm. after a while. And you also get cold. And so you got to get up and get some Mm. coffee. Well, this is such an interesting comparison with... It's difficult. Yeah. Well, with Kent, because Kent described to me many times and on camera and off uh, about his extensive research, research, most of many, many hours on mm-hmm. land mm-hmm. and, of course, in Africa. Mm-hmm. But uh, to compare it, I hadn't actually thought about what you just said, which is the above amount of below. time. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. If oh. you're above the water, if you're if you're on the land, you've got you've got much more time. But, but below the water, yeah. it's not not the same. Yeah. And, and some artists are, are very ambitious and take it a step further where they sit there with their, their sketching books or their canvas and actually record stuff right in front of them, which you could do. Uh, we got close enough to many of the of the cats there. Um, 
that stayed still for a long time. Uh, the leopards are generally on the move. My favorite animal, by the way, land oh. animal. They became anteaters. Hmm. Um, Big cats. And, and, and enough of them around that you can, you can guarantee to see them, you know, with a certain mm -hmm. time frame. Um, so, yeah, so interactions with these fish are, are really, really um, scarce. And I, we pioneered in the early 90s how to die with billfish. Mm. Um, and get them to hang around the boat, keep them there, keep them busy, and then you know, with no food, no hooking involved, um, and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And in in um, Guatemala, we were just there. I went for the single reason of getting more sailfish footage, which I'll show you, so you understand. Um, free swimming, not on a hook. You know, when you get them on a hook, they're the yeah. color changes, uh, behavior changes. Their color changes. changes? Do they yeah. actually change color? Oh, yeah, a lot. Oh, uh, wow. And nobody understood this until the summer. I'll show you in a sec here, Matt. These are spinning dolphins racing. Wow. But here come the sailfish. Look at that. On a teaser. There's no hook in it. Wow. Yeah. And so we. this is pretty easy to do nowadays. And you go to a place, like I said before, where you have a lot of these guys. So you go to Guatemala or El Salvador, or Panama, Costa Rica, Pacific side. And they're big fish. They're 100 pounds. You know, they're, and they sometimes comes in, come in two and, two and three and ten fish. Wow. That is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. But you see the how the foam above adds a little bit of drama to mm -hmm. this. And, of course, this is, you know, very helpful in terms of... Well, yeah. Was... All of that, you know, it's it's all display. They, they oh. fold everything down into their body and it, they become a javelin with a big tail. Oh. And they can move at 40 miles So an hour. fast. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So intriguing. Well, and, and you know, the sailfish um, uh, in Corpus, of course, yeah. you know, Kent's got his uh, sailfish yeah. there. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, 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 it's such, a, such an interesting thing to, to convert something that you've seen with your eye that is not something most people even ever get to see. Well, exactly. You know? So, yeah. And so the astounding thing was why, why are these fish jet black? Yeah, I, I want to know that like, too. It's like, what's going on here? What's the advantage to be jet black? And blue marlin will do the same. They, they turn completely black underwater. Um, and just, just their tail is, has a, flight, a bright sorry bright fluorescent blue color to it um which just is fluorescent their tail yeah just mm -hmm. the tail and it's like they're jet matte black but when when you get very close to them um you can see that the back is a, is a dark bluey green and the the, the flanks here you go <clears throat> the flanks oh, are really a coppery color when the sunlight hits them mm -hmm. so the black is not really black but look how there's no counter shading mm -hmm. here at all the belly is not white or the flanks are not bronze, but then they change color. This is the same fish. Are they different. hiding? Are they no, trying it's to be? It's a level of excitement. Oh, excitement. I think, yeah. So oh, they're telling wow. the prey <laughs> something. Oh. Some, some, something's about to happen here. Yeah. But so you can't paint them like that because you never sell them. Right. <laughs> so it's like, what do you do as an artist? You, you don't want to be uh, incorrect. So I spent, spent a long time. These are white marlin here, which we dive with in the Azores and uh, Venezuelan places. Um, and they have the same thing, but a different color arrangement. They look black from far with stripes, but that, that black is actually bronze and blue in, in a, that configuration. Um, <clears throat> anyway, well, you just saw a marlin up there. So and, and going back to the science where it really helps with the execution of the paintings, in addition to the underwater exposure, um, being close to nature, as Kent would say, is is um, your knowledge of the anatomy, the physiology, and the ecology of the animal is is absolutely fundamental to authentic execution. I mean that, and so so much of, there's so much crossover between the things that you've spoken about here today and things that that Kent has talked to us about. Um, one, one thing that we did ask him, you know, um, he, obviously he's, he's extremely, um, intent on making things realistic and, and yeah. representational. But, uh, one thing that I did ask him one time was if you had to say one reason why, 
you know, what, what you're trying to achieve with, with these massive, beautiful sculptures, what would you say it is? And he just, and his simple answer was, um, to get people to look at the sculpture and appreciate it enough to look around and see the nature and appreciate that the ultimate. And I wanted to ask you, is that the same reason for you or <clears throat> you know, where do you stand on that? Absolutely. I, I think it's, it's true for any, any wildlife artist, um, any artist at all that they all have a message to send. But nowadays, because as you're well aware, the, the, the negative factors influencing the planet just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And so um, the environment is more in people's mind nowadays than it was 20 years ago, for sure, when we we're all sort of midway through our careers. We're coming to the end of our careers um, now, and sadly, and um, you hope you've done a reasonable job. And I think the combination of the scientific research and the artwork um, and the results of all of our um, scientific work can just send, well, it sends a strong um, argument for um, doing better, and we have to do better. Um, there are ways to do better. And I don't know if you watch um, <clears throat> any of the, the new BBC production called Our Planet. I, I've, I've, heard, I've heard of watching. it, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. I will definitely check it out. Well, the quality of the, the, the footage is astounding, as always, with the BBC. Um, but the, the message sending is... Of course, they're focused very much on the healthy aspect of the ocean, both above and below the surface of the world, above and below, with um, David Attenborough narrating mm -hmm. beautifully, as he always does. Um, but the message is of hope, because there are places of local abundance that still exist. I'm not going to say untouched by people, but almost, uh, almost pristine, um, and, you know, you go to places like Tropic Star in Panama, you fly in by the Darien jungle that is absolutely untouched by humans, a large parts of it. And you go, wow, this is what it was really like. Mm -hmm. um, our trip to Cuba, to the south side, the, 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 the gardens of the Queen, where they've been protected for 75 years. And coral looks like it looked like in Jamaica when I was a kid. It wow. was just like, wow. Yeah. You know, if we do the right thing, based on science, we can get back a, lo a lot of these places uh, because there's so much doom and gloom. People are very focused on the negative. It sells papers, it sells, it drives eyeballs, it, it makes money for people, bad news. Um, and the environment is certainly top of mind nowadays, more than ever before. Yeah, yeah, that is, and it was something that was pretty prevalent in his book too, yeah. was um, that, that it, that, the ability or the i think what he said at the time like and i'm probably going to butcher this quote but <laughs> but i'll have to go back and correct it uh was that you know if if you if you were alive during a different period you would have for sure painted about such and such thing and he's like and during our during my time this is this is the thing so okay. that's what i'm painting mm -hmm. um and i think it may have come in response to the the exon valdez spill yeah. With uh, the 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 um, uh, the Prince Prince William Sound, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, and the eagle he did, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and so you know, a, a good question would be, well, why why have you sp um, concentrated your research effort on sharks to such a great extent mm -hmm. uh, through Nova Southeast? And well, it's actually Professor Mahmoud Shivji's choice to do it. But I recognize the urgency that he sees in, in, in getting research work done uh, because we sponsor a large part of it, along with other people, by the way. He's not totally dependent on our, our um, support. Um, but with sharks, because of the, the inordinate level of um, just catching sharks for the last 30 years through the shark fin trade, and he was the first person ever to, to put a an estimate, and it is an estimate, on the amount of sharks killed per year in the shark fin trade in 2004 um, at 73, up to 73 million sharks a year in wow. just the, the shark fin trade alone. That doesn't exclude, include other um, methods of, of, of using sharks. But the oriental, the shark fin soup business is, has been the big driver. It still is. It may be coming down a bit. 
but it's a diabolical thing, Denise, which if you're, if you're not familiar with it, the mm -hmm. sharks are caught, the fins are cut off when they're brought on board alive, and the, the, they're kept and the, the body is discarded. So that's it. Alive. All they take is the fin, Filling, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, and then it's and of course they they. How long does it take to die after that for them? Well, they suffocate basically because they they can't swim, so oh. probably not very long. But you know, it's a waste of good protein. All sharks are good to eat, um, and many countries now have have banned finning itself. Mm. You have to bring in the whole animal, therefore the the body is used for something. But. Um, it's it's just annihilated the group of animals, and it's particularly sad, Matt, because there, there are five hundred twelve, five thirteen species of sharks, but there are about fifty of them that are really heavily fished, and they, they happen to be the the coastal or and uh, oceanic pelagics like that one, um, and so their numbers have really crashed. I mean, there mm. there are a small percentage of their pre exploitation level left down to 5%, 2%, uh, which is why the urgency comes in because, mm -hmm. you know, once you bring that population down to such a low number, th they can't even find enough to, to breed and keep going. Um, so nowadays they, they reckon there's up to 100 million sharks killed a year, but I, I find that hard to believe because A, no survey can be done. Right. You can't have access to the Hong Kong shark fin trade like we did in 2004 um and you know shark fins have become like cocaine now tuna has become like cocaine somebody wow. said because they become so valuable because they are they're so that's a shocking comparison yeah. too yeah. yeah it's big money uh limited resource etc cetera, etc cetera. so there is urgency with sharks mm -hmm. um and because they're long lived slow growing uh, that that's the problem. You can't bash them too hard because they, they they their biology won't allow them to compensate for your extraction rate. Oh. Turtles are the same thing. That's why they're taking so long to come back. But they are coming back because they have sympathy. Mm -hmm. Generating sympathy for sharks is it's much harder. harder. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, at the end of every episode, mm. we always sum it up with three. T we call it our top three what do i call it yeah it's like a t it's like you know we're both <clears throat> teachers so you know we we, we used to have, you, if you have a whole class of something and then you get to the end of it especially with kids you go hey look if you got nothing else out of today mm -hmm. yeah what you know, are we talked about a lot of stuff mm -hmm. you got nothing else out of today what yeah. would be what those? are three things that you learned from today's mm -hmm. lesson and so um you might have seen me writing as you yeah. were talking and so we kind of wrap up every episode with three takeaways that we have. And so um, I'll share, Matthew, a couple of mine. I don't know if you have any to add, but well, you guys are. I think I think it'd be good. You you did some writing. Maybe <laughs> maybe you share yours. Okay. And then we'll let Guy add on or. Mm -hmm. or uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So my first one came early in the conversation and it was talking about your artwork and how times are different from. Uh, maybe when you and Kent first started as artists to where maybe artists are today. And so one thing that stuck with me was uh, you said leverage, or I took it as this, leverage all the options to get your work in front of people. And so back back in the day, you had to carry around all of mm. your paintings and all of your things to different shows that you could. But today, um, folks have different means to share it. And the internet has a lot to do with it. So I think that was a big takeaway for artists to know that you're in a different time, but it's important to leverage all those opportunities. And there's nothing like meeting people face to face. And nothing like for the customer to look at the art for real rather than on a computer screen, even though the computer screen can be very helpful in selling art for you mm -hmm. because it's like a light box almost. The paintings do come to light. Mm -hmm. um, different for sculpture, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. So the importance of also understanding when people can see you and meet you, that mm -hmm. makes a bigger impact. If If you, yeah, you have to have patience is the first thing you need. <laughs> Um, secondly, just um, you know, share ideas, and especially with kids, um, and always welcome them. Hey, can I show you something? What I've done, mm -hmm. you know, always find that time. 
Yeah. Because they, they really appreciate it. And I followed up with many kids in the past. And I got to tell you the story. Um, I know we're running out of time. No, but no, we're not. This this young chap from um, uh, northern Alabama, they, ha they have a lovely southern accent there in case you <laughs> don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, it's a real draw. Um, his name is Nolan Godwin. And um, his parents came to came out every year to you know dive and do stuff like that he's a, a single only child and he had this affinity for art and they would drop him off at the gallery and came in to go and doodle and sit there and he'd sit there for three hours as they go diving and do stuff um and we had a gallery manager so there's always somebody there it's not like you're leaving a abandoning your kid they're gonna run off and jump in the ocean or something it was all quite safe and uh, the, the second year he came back, he was 12, and um, he said, Mr. Harvey, and he had this lovely accent. <laughs> he said, I, I, I had an art show, and I, I sold some art, and um, I, I made $1,500, and I gave $500 to my church, and I want to give $1,000 to the Guy Harvey Foundation. And he pulled out 10 Ben Franklins and put them on the desk. Wow. And it was like, Holy cow, you know, that the guy is really motivated. When I give a presentation, I say about educating yourself about marine issues and learn about natural history of, of the oceans and take action. Well, I said Nolan took action. He donated $1,000 of his hard-earned money at the age of 12. Wow. Yeah. And so we named one of the Mako Sharks after him. Oh, um, So wow. he had a two-year track because it, it paid for half of a tag. And, um, and so he was able to tell all his peers and – you know, family and friends about this is Nolan, my shark, and it wow. did, a, did a good track, did maybe 12,000 miles or something. But it was like a way of thanking him for doing it. But, um, and he'll never forget that, it, yeah. and he'll always and we have talk some affinity this, for it. Yeah, we talk to this day. In fact, I owe him a, um, an email. They haven't been back to Cayman since the pandemic, but um, he's also a very good soccer player. And he got scouted by Barcelona Football Club. Oh, oh wow! So he did one of their six-week training sessions. And um, how old is he now? Yeah, he he be seventeen now. Wow! Seventeen, yeah. Wow. Well, well um, hi Nolan, if yeah. you're listening. <laughs> yeah, Nolan, great guy. Um, he'll go a long way. Very talented, very sporty, very well brought up in a southern style. Um, I, I like to tell that story. But there are other kids who made enormous donations to, seemingly, um, to the foundation because they're motivated. Um, mm -hmm. um, they see the, the value of it and they spread the word. They're our best ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And probably because they got to meet you personally. Well, that's easy for me. It's, you know, this is the easy part of what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't like the business part of it nearly as much. I, I like the creative part and the, storytelling and yeah you know. absolutely yeah. that's that that makes perfect sense to me mm -hmm. too and kent has it's funny because kent's really you know if we get him I, you know you can prompt him with one thing and he'll tell you it just mm -hmm. leaves oh, yeah. one story after the you know he's got well, so many he, of them he's he's got he got a decade in this business on me easily wow yeah. um and so um i hope my next decade is as active as he is <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Yeah. Um, okay. Number two, mm -hmm. uh, a point that you made was just the importance of research mm -hmm. and collecting data. And uh, uh, what stuck out to me was that it was for the benefit of the animals, but all, for animals, but also most importantly, um, or in addition, like the community around it. You know, everybody has to understand the impact that they have on. Um, the ecosystem that they're a part of, and and that's through research and data. M moving through life, you leave a wake, mm -hmm. and that wake can be very destructive. Um, and you have to understand fully the consequences of the wake that you meet, you leave behind you, mm -hmm. whether it's literally in terms of you know how you live your life and your lifestyle and, and be. Um, impact on other people mm -hmm. uh, and and we make assumptions that we think are right uh, 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 based upon the little that we know about things and so that's why I think research and data help us 
validate or invalidate what those assumptions totally. are. Totally, and yeah. um, the, the the research landscape for one is is always changing. Um, you're always learning something extra new. Um, you know, we avoid duplicity, as I said, and always you're always looking for something different to learn about an animal. And to this day, the the ocean, well, it will always remain for all of us the, the greatest teacher because you think you know everything. In, like it is a big place, um, and there's lots of stuff to learn all the time. And even though I go back to the same place often, and I get criticized for that sometimes, <laughs> why <Well>, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is you're you're always learning, and you can pick up so much more um, influence, uh, ideas, um, experience. Um, uh, and just inspiration from going to the same place over and over again. Mm -hmm. There are five chapters in this book on Isla Mujeres in Mexico, mm. in the Yucatan. Different times of year, different animals come through, different yeah. experiences. Um, Kent said yeah. the exact same thing about mm. Africa. He said, you know, he said, I, I, the things that I sculpted and that that were based on my experiences in Africa then would be totally different now, yeah. you know, and he's, and, and he even talked about becoming so fascinated with the big cats and the big animals, the apex predators. And then he said, as he had gotten to a different point, he feels like he would notice more birds. Mm -hmm. He would notice, right. you know, so it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I, and again, a lot of that depends on the guide. And once I told oh. the guide in different places, well, I love birds just as much. He said, well, if there was a quiet time, could spend more time looking at birds because they would stop mm. and listen for 10 minutes and not move and listen to everything that's going on because everything is a message uh, to them. Well, this this guy just saw a, uh, a leopard and he gave the alarm sound and it could be a mile away. He can pick it up. Wow. Stuff like that. Yeah. And there's a story behind this leopard here. I call him Yellow Bulls. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he had been up in a tree driven up by, they have Yellow Bulls. <laughs> The vervet monkeys have blue walls. It's like, oh. God, oh. poor you. <laughs> um, and and this leopard had a story because he just made a kill of a Niala. Mm. And before we got there, the wild dogs came, caught him with it, drove him up the tree. He was definitely pissed off. And by the time we got there, there were also hyenas coming around challenging the wild dogs. And I didn't realize how how accomplish the wild dogs are in fending off everything because they're fast they are very um uh coordinated and they they kept the um uh hyenas at bay while he's sitting up in the tree going like, oh. when is this gonna end oh you man know, he'd driven off his yep. breakfast and eventually the the wild dogs ate their fill there were only six of them there the hyenas got in and started to um harassed them and I got great shots of a hyena running right by the, the truck with a leg in its mouth. Oh my gosh. And that's when it and I gotta show you these shots. It it said I'll get to the point where it said, hmm yeah, this is this is him up in the tree. <laughs> kind of looking, when is this gonna be over? And then here comes oh. one of the hyenas with the. Oh, he's got a leg in his mouth. Oh, man. It, look at that. Right by us. Oh, there. wow. And he goes, ah, I think I'll have a little stretch. <laughs> and he's up in the trees, 50 feet above us. And he's looking, is the coast clear now? Mm, safe to come down? Wow. And that's and the shot. Then, this is the shot when he starts to come down. But I'm, I'm shooting a, quite a fast frame. Wow. Yeah. And uh, with a 400 yep. lens. And you know, you zoom in on it, and every Ugh. every hair is there. Wow! And he came down the tree. He stopped for a second to have a better look. Wow! Around. What a great it, shot! Just stopped there. But it, oh, like, that's beautiful! It's, it's like a fixed shot. I mean, so this was all on a four hundred lens. Yep. Yeah. And then he came right down the tree. He's, he's like, time to leave. He didn't get anything to eat. He didn't get anything to eat. But I love this shot. He's like, I am gone. But you can see he's got yellow balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, he does. Jeez, but they really are he, yellow. He's a nice animal, Matt. And, you know, very chunky. We saw a lot of the, the smaller females. And there was another time, it, probably the only painting I would attempt. And I thought about this. I was about to say, are you going to see? A, the photography and, and 
the detail you can catch nowadays is so good. Kind of the detail is very challenging. Hair, hair bear, fur bearing animals <laughs> and painting hair and getting all that. This would be a real mm. challenge. But the one thing I wanted to 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 try and I did a few sketches. We got into this piece of grass and we knew there was a female leopard around because we'd, we'd followed her for maybe an hour. And she got into this place and there was another vehicle off to one side and another one further behind. And we saw the grass move. We couldn't see her. And the the tracker said, no, it's not her. It's guinea fowl. And the the, the tracker, the driver, his name was Ruin. He should have said to us, she's over there somewhere. And I'm gonna, there's some guinea fowl right in front of us in the grass. And I'm going to just maneuver so that they, they kind of go over to order. We'll see what happens. And had we had just the iPhone going, oh, I wish. Because it yeah. happens so fast. Oh, and man. as we move along, the grass starts to move a little bit, move a little bit. We're all thinking it's her. But then they flush. And like 40 of these guinea fowl get up into the air from like the door away to the car away. And like a Polaris missile, this leopard comes oh, out of that grass. Wow. Like in slow motion, like a girlie trying to save a goal. You know, Lionel Messi has <laughs> just shot wow. it. And she, you know, like whoo, missed and feathers were flying. And she turned and landed just like a cat, just as you'd expect. Boom, you know, tidily in the grass, disappeared. Wow. But we caught it out of just that. And not even just a... Just here. It, yeah. And yeah. nobody got a picture. Oh, yeah. man. Even the cars far away, not the cars, the, the trucks. 20, 30 yards away. I said, did you see that? I said, yeah, we saw it. <laughs> Nobody got a picture. God. So oh, that, that's something I would attempt to paint. But I, I'd have to get my ducks in a row, literally, my leopards in a row. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, is... it, it would be a challenge, but it, it would be a great painting because of the action, the color of the grass. Yeah. It was evening light. Light was on her. Um, the, the, the contrast with the guinea fowl flushed. The beautiful bluey gray color, the detail in the faces and the heads and the, and the alarm, you know, and then the, I don't know how I would do it. the arms, the, the four, yeah. four limbs going. No, but that would be incredible. That would be very, very challenging. Yeah. Uh, wow. What an image. I, I think I think I have enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be on the lookout yeah. for that, right? Yeah. Um, okay. And my yeah. final, um, Sorry. I guess, takeaway was that. You said um, understanding when and how collaboration is beneficial. Uh, you know, that was my summary of it. But, um, you know. I, I, I welcome collaboration, certainly in science. I mean, we, we all do it. And to be honest with you, you know, there are people and it's inflicted our organization too who keep their cards very close to their chest. And it's not the way to go. Mm. Uh, and it's all... It all boils down to money and raising money for grants. And, you know, you're competing with somebody else, you know, for a limited budget from some other well-meaning group or foundation or whatever. And it's the sort of sticky side of the research work is where, you know, where's my next grant going to come from? Um, apart from all your commitments to teaching and mentoring students and all that. Um, but collaboration is the key. And we can only really achieve meaningful results by by kind of pooling that resource, the, the funding, and getting it done. And most of that, sadly, comes from private sources nowadays. There's not much money available, certainly in the U.S. government, very little in Cayman, where I live, and none in Central America mm. at all. <laughs> it's shameful that they don't put any money into research work. Mm. Mm. So that's the problem with that. In terms of art... You know, in certain cases, I'm going to do it. It's fun. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy interacting with the violin. <laughs> being being on a, a wall painting with him, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's, you know, up here or in the Keys. We've done a few in the Keys. It's like being on a movie set. You know? <laughs> oh, it really yeah. is. There's tons of people around. There's all kind of well wishes and clients yeah. for him. And, hmm. you know, he'll paint for two hours and then get off and sign merchandise for an hour and get back up and we, we do it together and swap ideas. And it's fun. Um, I haven't really done them with anybody else to that extent. Um, but to find that 
you know, I think that's one of the things with in filmmaking that is so that is that part part of the fun of it is the collaborative part. Yeah. You know, you especially if you find if you find the right people to work with. Yeah. There are times where it can be miserable, but mm -hmm. yeah. well, we, I do it with a. We're trying to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. we're, yeah. we're more effective together than apart. So, yep. <clears throat> um, but there are lots of artists with whom he's collaborated, and there was that style that came out of Hawaii or. You know the west coast of of America, California, um, where there was a lot of ocean focus or above and below focus, and you get one artist to do mm. the cliffs and the jungle, and somebody else to do the, yeah. the underneath. Very effective result, and, yeah. and you know, aesthetically very appealing. Bright sunsets or lovely waterfalls. Add the odd whale and dolphin, and you know. Yeah, uh, you know, Kent uh, mentioned because he took us to the well, we went and visited uh, the studio in Loveland, and then he yeah. took us to the, Dem the to the Denver uh, Science Museum where he did oh, the yeah. dioramas. Yeah, and he talked about having various amazing. painters for the dioramas. Yeah, they're amazing, mm -hmm. astounding detail. Yeah. 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 Well, Guy, thank you so much for uh, letting us come to your beautiful gallery here in Fort Lauderdale and sitting and talking with us for gosh a couple hours oh we, yeah we were able to to just hear your stories and we enjoyed it and we just really appreciate it well yeah. thank you very much for, for a coming all this way and b uh, for the interest and of course your combined knowledge is tremendous in its own right so thank you very much for sharing it with me Yes. Oh, yeah. completely enlightening and uh, thank you again and we'll look forward to catching up again tomorrow morning yeah. great and I, I haven't even told you about the, the succession because I have two siblings two kids rather who um, <laughs> who are very much into all this too. yes so, yes we'd love to hear about yes. that that's and the next chapter yes. love that and yep. and for listeners um, make sure that you check out the latest books from Guy Harvey which is 10,000 chicken sandwiches which you heard the story about we're also looking at um, Guy Harvey's Underwater World and uh, also the original, right? Portraits from the Deep. Right. And, and then Santiago's Finest Hour, which is... The Hemingway story. The yeah. Hemingway, mm -hmm. beautiful. From 1974, yeah. Love it. Yeah. Well... And I'll make sure all of these are in the, the show notes. Oh, thank like you that. very much. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. hasta la pasta. All right. <laughs>